please take your seats. Also, please put off your mobile phones and put them on the so-called silent mode. And Namaskar, good evening. On behalf of the Raza Foundation and the India Habitat Center, we welcome you to this inaugural lecture in our new series, Charles Korea Memorial Lecture. This is the eighth annual lecture that we will be organizing now. The other lectures are in the names of Kumar Gandhar, Habib Tanbir, Daya Krishna, Kedu Charan Mahapati, Mani Kaur, Ake, V.S. Gaitonde, etc. And we are very happy that the series in the name of Charles Korea is being inaugurated in a manner of speaking by Romy Khosla. Charles Korea had a special relationship both with Raza Saab and with me. Raza Saab was a huge admirer of his architecture and there was a time when a museum, a traditionally designed museum in Monton, very close to his south French village, was planning to have a section devoted to Raza and his wife Janine Monshila. Charles had gone there, had seen the place, and they were under discussion as to how to go about it. Somehow the project did not materialize. And I, of course, had the chance to know Charles very closely when he was designing Bharat Bhavan in Bhopal, later Vidhan Bhavan in Bhopal, and also the Jawahar Kala Kendra in Jaipur. So, uh, when he passed away, we thought it appropriate to have, to remember him by a, a lecture series. Rumi Khosla, as most of you know, is one of our most internationally well-known architect and somebody who thinks deeply about architecture and urban plan. He had a double graduation from Cambridge University Economics and the Architectural Association in London. He has designed and built over a hundred buildings, some of which have been awarded with national and international honors. In 2014, his Volvo Aisha headquarters building was given the International Leeds Platinum Award. As an urban planner, he worked with his teacher, Dr. Amad Sain, on problems of slum upgradation in Bombay with the support of DFID and the Slum Federation of Bombay and as a principal consultant to UNDP, UNESCO, WTO, UNOPS, a jury member of the Aga Foundation Awards and the city of Izmir in Turkey and worked on conflict resolution, UN missions in the Middle East, the Balkans and Cyprus and on master planning missions in Tibet, China and Central Asia. He has been an earth walker for decades, traveling on foot by the searching ancient Buddhist sites in the deeper Himalayas, the findings of which were published as a book. 
Romy Kostner. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> It's a great honor <coughs> for me to give this first uh, Charles Gray Memorial Lecture uh, for the Raza Foundation. Especially as I, as I uh, greatly value Charles' friendship and advice, and we often exchange ideas about um, India and Asia. Many of us had hoped that when he became chairman of the Urbanization Commission, some of his ideas would uh, begin to be implemented and perhaps give us a better future in our cities. But unfortunately, the bureaucrats bypassed his recommendations. Um, and later, as we know, they were seduced by this ridiculous idea of smart cities. Happily, the Raza Foundation is setting the record straight. And they have created this platform in his memory where contemporary ideas on urban India can be exchanged and put forward. And here are my link <coughs> first bricks um, by asking what will happen next to our urban landscape and what choices the next generation will have. My grandfather was born after 1857 and lived through post-independence <coughs> times. He had served the empire as a uh, sub-magistrate uh, on one of his summons by the commissioner who told him about his promotion, he excused himself and returned with his letter of resignation. Years later, when I uh, talked to his younger brother, he informed me that, uh, that the commissioner had tried to persuade him to take back his resignation. Not because he valued my grandfather's services, it's because he didn't want to put my grandfather's letter on the file, which ended <clears throat> with the sentence, I refuse to serve this satanic government anymore. Uh, Our stubborn grandfather had chosen not to fulfill his quota of instigating two riots in the Muslim riots a month in his district in Punjab. Like in so many other families, <clears throat> about stories about riots have come down um, to us since his times, and both sides of my family. After my grandfather, it was my father who led many an inquiry, uh, commission of inquiry into riots, and after that it was my father-in-law who kept experiencing, experiencing them. He was in fact so deeply shocked by the 1970s the one day riots that he came back home with the memory, awful memories revived and wrote Thomas virtually without getting up. Now I assume that it is my turn to explain the fires appearing on my grandson's mobile. He will ask me about riots as I had asked my grandfather I was sitting in the train as we were being pelted with stones steaming out of Lahore. I'm not sure what my grandfather told me at that time, but I would certainly respond to my grandson and say to him, ever since your great-great-grandfather's times, people from the same gang have been ruling us, tearing us apart, getting rich in a hurry, by leaving nothing behind for ordinary people. And that's why his great great grandfather had resigned. My grandson would wonder whether events from such a long duration of time would keep affecting us all and would naturally ask, so what happens next? Um, I would borrow his imagination for an hour and introduce him to the rhythms of time 
which are different from the constant daily splashes and ripples of time that are important to his generation. Maybe suggest to him that one requires to think simultaneously about two durations of time in one's life. The day-to-day -day oscillations of events and also the rhythm of time of generations, events which influence the flow in the currents of time through our lives, uh, coming from the distant past and then going into the future. So I would travel while narrating to him with him on one such current of time uh, about an event uh, from the distant past in the 17th century, uh, which has influenced us very deeply and will continue to do so till it wanes in the coming centuries, 22nd century. This evening's uh, narration fills that hour. I would need to propose to what happens next to answer his anticipated question. My story from the distant past begins not over here, but in the south and north parts of the ancient Americas, at a time when the southern parts of the continent were being overrun by armed Iberian brigands who were looting its ancient treasures and carrying it back home, and the northern parts of the states which were being overrun by Anglo-Saxon adventurers who led the early waves of migrants to that continent. There, just after around 1600, uh, they set up in the north townships like the one in Jamestown, mostly populated by teenagers, servants indentured in England, whose fathers had signed them off to guarantee unpaid jobs till they came of age in exchange for a free passage. The inhabitants of Jamestown were amongst plenty of other poor outcasts, criminals, commuted prisoners from English jails, who had also exchanged their services for free passages to ancient America so that they could search for a new life new hunting grounds, a new world without laws where hunting, stealing, and exterminating animals and indigenous humans was expected as a way of survival and prosperity. And afterwards, when nobody was left to do the enormous work to set up the new world, English company, one in particular, registered on the stock exchange, uh, brought them slaves from, from Africa. If my grandson <coughs> becomes familiar with imagining what has happened and what will happen <coughs> through working on the two time rhythms simultaneously, then it would be easier for him to understand how this unprecedented migration eventually led to the creation of an entirely new country whose ways of seeing and ideology were to cause profound changes in the ruling elite of Europe, profound changes that would eventually be adopted by us and our rulers. That fresh society in the new world had begun life by occupying the geography stolen from the natural people who were obliterated. Some 130 million population of Mughal India at the time was 160 million. A society whose ethnocentric ways of seeing and sense of righteousness was a mix of masochistic theism and militarism in the south and greed of the outcast Anglo-Saxons in the north laid the foundations of that country and of that society. A society for whom the land indeed belonged to the living. The modern era had begun 200 years after Columbus landed. Much of the climate of gentleness, peacefulness gave way to imperialistic expansionist militancy and violence. As time went on, uh, that pretentious society collectively evolved 
into a wealthy, militant society, prospering and motivated primarily by devising more and more innovative ways of getting rich and arming themselves to become powerful. When they began, they began with the uh, independence movement, war, 25,000 were killed. Then it went on to a civil war, which they fought amongst each other, in which 625,000 people were killed before they settled down. And again, then began the theatre period of killing people in other countries in exchange for... What they exchanged in war was commercially controlled democracy that would ignore the poor as we have done. Not much was different from the way those societies were set up and in the way things are moving in this direction here. To explain the sense of scale of immense changes brought on by this unprecedented migration, I would relate to him how once upon a time, those who became our colonial masters had lived for centuries on a tiny island, not smaller than the state of Jammu and Kashmir, going about their business, muttering things about their weather, growing Brussels sprouts, rearing their cows. Um, a situation that has been vividly portrayed in Mel Gibson's Brave Hearts or in uh, Game of Thrones that my grandson would have seen. How odd that these small islanders could then spring up so suddenly in the 18th century and make their country the wealthiest and most powerful in the world. This sprang up during an extraordinary moment in the history when they temporarily forgot their long yearning for centuries. They've had this long yearning for the emporium luxuries of Asia. Uh, they got mesmerized by the Inca, Mayan, and Aztec treasures, and their bullion mines, and the Silver Mountains, and that vast free land which seemed to have dropped out of the sky into their destiny. And dreaming about suddenly getting rich, because the, the, the place was full of these stories about how you could get rich immediately. More and more jobless English and Irish rushed across the oceans, leaving behind their peaceful shires, becoming seamen to bring back the legendary loot from the Americas. Since North America never had ancient treasures, they began plundering by using piracy to loot the gold being shipped by the Spaniards and the Portuguese. English pirates became legendary, grabbing it on the high seas, using the services of the Royal Navy and their fast slim ships and cannons to rob the Spanish galleons. England needed the silver desperately, and it was being mined in Bolivia, Peru, and Brazil, where it was uh, because the indigenous population had, was no longer there. They then brought the slaves from Africa to mine the gold and the silver for them. So as a result, England became exceptionally rich. In the 200 years between 1500 and 1700, its national income increased by more than 12 times, while its population remained stable. It's a mistake to assume that it was the Industrial Revolution that made England rich. It made it richer but they had the money, an enormous amount of money, before the Industrial Revolution began. And that's why the Industrial Revolution began. England ascended the world and continued to do so, and then founded the institutions of financial management and the institutions for learning. In a lighter vein, I would ask my grandson, to imagine Johnny Depp as uh, the real Caribbean pirate, Sir Morgan, Sir Henry Morgan, uh, appointed Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica to raid ships on the Spanish Main from the Governor's Palace at Port Royal. What happened to all those pirates, he would ask? Well, they were, of course, reborn in India 
to serve the East India Company. And, and then again, reborn again as Vijay Malia and Nirav Modi and Nirav Choksi, etc. the rest. So piracy has a long duration. <laughs> Phenomenon that is, to say, that is to, uh, here to stay because I would read to him from a UN report that has come out, quoting, um, piracy causes any, any poor country that wants to get rich in a hurry uh, has the option of going for piracy, um, as before. Um, piracy causes 7 to 12 billion dollars in losses for the global economy. Naturally, the report says with economic losses this high, the issue of piracy in Somalia is of great urgency to the global community. The sudden acquisition of such wealth, the ease with which it came, the extent of the injustices without answerable consequences, all of these sound familiar, yes. And the respectability and rewards given to large-scale enterprises engaging in crimes in other countries transform the ambitions of these small island people. The looting led to a new awakening. A bend appeared in their mindset which changed their collective and belief systems and ways of seeing and turned them over to the dark side, from where they concocted new theories about their fictitious supremacy. Their dark, attractive new ways of seeing spread to the colonies first, and then spread on like a cloud across the globe, till it became part of the unified geopolitical totality uh, in which the urge for greed and violence were henceforth seen as unavoidable psychological extensions of human behavior. To begin with, this unrestrained, it began, it began as an unrestrained Protestant individualism. And it was taken to awesome heights by a very tiny elite of barons who gave power to new institutions to control the new wealth and to produce knowledge, new banks were set up to channel wealth to the speculators for investment in the cities which came up at the time. The Bank of England was, was founded in 1694, as early as 1694, just as this enormous wealth was pouring into uh, Britain. Britain. Um, for controlling the production of knowledge, they established royal societies and academies. And these were set up 30 or 40 years before the Bank of England was set up. And as urban land became precious, the developer barons uh, used to um, regularly round up the unemployed uh, slum inhabitants, war widows, orphans, and export them uh, to the new colonies of America. Australia and New Zealand. They never really had poverty as a problem. So when in 1776 uh, the 13 English colonies declared their independence, England spread its economic geography east to India to make its second colony. Possessing India became a matter of survival for them. I would read my grandson a short passage from Cecil Rhodes' speech um, in 1890, which is about 25 years after the uh, American Civil War. Uh, he says, in order to save the 40 million inhabitants of the United Kingdom from a bloody civil war, the petrified would happen there, our colonial statesmen must acquire new lands for settling the surplus population of the country to provide new markets. The empire as I have always said, is a bread and butter question. Um, and so it was that they arrived in India, the bread and butter India, and were able to prove their theories about their superiority because they hadn't been able to do so in America. There were no natives left there. And the point of my story would be to show him how little had really changed since we had become part of the empire. 
His great great grandfather, the one who resigned, had lived in the same period as Cecil Rhodes, and so my story would move towards explaining to him my inability to understand the difference between being ruled by the English elite uh, and being ruled by the Indian elite, and how we were still being ruled by an imperial mindset. Our treasuries are empty from stealing, as they were under British rule. Our current rulers, I would explain to him, are for the second time reshaping the economic geography uh, and the people of India and squeezing them for export. As the English had done when they set up their <coughs> railway systems, our financial and political elite has come up with this new idea of industrial corridors to move us around, shuffle our settlements, and squeeze India home for exports. And the British had done it when they set up the terminal cities in the ports. They had to move large amounts of populations to, to, to occupy them. The, the um, current Delhi-Mumbai uh, industrial corridor expects 30% of India's population to move to the project area. Our smart cities are going to be gated with dedicated communities of coders, as the British had created the dedicated community of Babus, occupying floor after floor in the smart cities, processing for export and services. At this point, I expect my grandson uh, to stop me uh, and ask me why I was being so pessimistic. I would apologize for being in the dark on the dark. Assure him that we would soon discuss my dreams. Uh, one can only dream if he imagined that the nightmare would end and the dreams would come true. Uh, I would explain uh, why my nightmares about an implosion linger. Because they come from my experiencing uh, UN missions in failed countries, where I was reviving obliterated urban landscapes, living and working amongst people who had no hope. And these were countries that had been brought to ruin by strong, simple-minded <coughs> rulers of the kind we have recently become familiar with, who had ruled them as their personal fiefdoms. I had experienced such levels of ex suspicion and mistrust amongst communities that had lived together for centuries while working in Kosovo, Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania, Cyprus, as well as Palestine. Places, places I had found twisted, folded over by some strong ruler who had obliterated their long duration, self-sufficiency and diversity. I had walked through the social and economic debris left behind by the Allied Empire, who in turn had destroyed another empire which had lasted seven uh, decades. So apart from the dangers of, of a failing state, I would also at this moment remind my grandson of the dangers of climate change and how climate change had caused four years of drought in Syria and enormous migrations, which had then led to the war of 2011. I would have to convince my grandson that the future of the subcontinent can only be re rescued by reassembling it, and preparing it for its long-term survival. The era of nation building with wars, revolutions, profitable pirating and fake promises is coming to a close. Uh, but such a reclamation of the future would happen and could only happen if we begin to prepare for it now. What happens next will be influenced primarily with the success with which we connect to that long, prolonged continuity that has always been, that sense of history that has always been uh, prevailed in our cultural, social and economic activities before we uh, began trying to be Atlanticists. And by that sense of prolonged continuity, I mean the formation of a compendium of regional identities, 
that supersedes our dysfunctional centralized state and synthetic national identity. The reassembly of our subcontinent requires new regional identities that prosper differently from each other with the help of completely new sets of national networks that link the sub-regional nodes, and I will describe those to you. I wonder whether he would agree with the need to dismantle the Leviathan hold of our nation state and replace it with completely new production processes and decentralized workplaces <coughs> where diverse ages and races could form the basis of a work collective where, for instance, four generations of people could work together. I would propose to him a new kind of reassembled subcontinent, a republic of such self-sufficient regions with different prosperity levels, all working under a commonly shared uh, national universal social welfare system. I would ask him to let his imagination wander to and fro across time, momentarily living, momentarily living in the past, in the present, and in the future, and in the future behind us. The future behind us could be imagined by him if he could connect to that sense of prolonged continuity, which has flowed through the many long duration eras when our geography and our economy was diversely inhabited across the entire subcontinent. Throughout history, we have prospered differently and unevenly, and yet have been linked together by merchants and traders working across the land in multinodal economies with a high degree of regional independence and multiple identities. The new urban landscapes of the future that I'm proposing to my grandson are made from such clusters self-governing and self-sustained nodal settlements which have which go up and down in their level of growth and prosperity, etc. <coughs> National governance in such a republic is there to ensure a safe security net and national defense and also a, a backup for communities and segments who are unable to uh, prosper. How we synchronize our natural geography with our future identity will determine the framework of our economy in the coming era. Our subcontinent is placed in the center of an arc of adjacent ocean territories to its east and to its west. By its sheer size, its commercial and cultural gravity magnetically attracts inter-regional trade and minds. It has always done, as it slowly paces its prosperity. Before the colonial era, when the rhythms of time and wealth accumulation and knowledge flowed slowly from east to west, day-to-day -day events had less urgency. The economic, uh, cultural, and religious, and linguistic exchanges were enormous. Self-sufficiency, barter of trade uh, played a major role, and prosperity came from uh, trade and exchange of goods and services, and knowledge within each of the sub-regions in the pre-European oceanic world. And I would introduce him to the work of K. N. Chowdhury, a student of Fanan Brodel, who had explored the flows uh, of the long duration eras during which our transoceanic linkages had sustained our tolerant ethical principles of commercial transactions, religious and social practices. Before the empire had descended and begun controlling and uh, appropriating our wealth. So what happens <coughs> next will therefore depend on when the compass <coughs> of our ambitions gets realigned to our long duration east-west axis, away from the current north-south axis. It will depend on whether we can go beyond the templates of linear progress and move on towards multiple levels of progress and how quickly 
we begin to ignore the bogey of growth, development, and GDP. Whether we can build instead a widely distributed level of prosperity through intercity trade between internal regions, our neighboring countries, and their cities, and whether we can build new reserves and have a strong currency to support entirely new interregional patterns of trade to fund them. Um, and how quickly we can depopulate our metro cities and replace them with a new generation of natural cities in the coming era. Sudden climate change alterations will begin to hit us in the coming long duration. We can withstand the impacts of adopting multiple diverse community resistances to the crisis. Change is already spilling over into the entire socioeconomic geography of India. Only locally led, micro-level, sustainable regions with diverse local cultures can collectively safeguard and insulate us from the tremors of both climatic change and the financial collapse of the macro system. Today I have been talking about the different rhythms of time and events which have occurred during the varying cycles of time. The possibilities of living and prospering in a slower and prolonged civilization are realistic. They are realistic because it is difficult to resolve the dangers of living in our polarized urban civilization. Catastrophic climate change has begun already to affect our agricultural production, increasing the migrations and making the cities ungovernable. It's very slow, but it's a trend that is going one way. So during my grandson's lifetime, uh, more than half the population of Asia would have moved into cities. That same Asia that must in the future become part of our long duration prosperity. We have no alternatives. And so we must prepare ourselves for devising new urban landscapes using new strategies to protect ourselves from moving into entirely different kinds of cities. And I call them for the moment natural Zilla cities, which will serve the 650 districts or zillas uh, that constitute this country and there could be over a thousand <coughs> self-sustained cities um, distributed um, in the zillas which themselves are composed of clusters of panchayats of which we have a quarter of a million, 250,000 panchayats. Now the 73rd and 74th amendment uh, with which money is fully familiar, has already empowered this change to take place. And every successive government has blocked it. The panchayats today are powerless. And yet, they are the only defense mechanisms that we will have to rely on in the coming era. In the new landscape of the next era, each of these panchayats and zillas are to become democratic, powerful, and interconnected, not only to each other, but across the nation, across the region, across the world. And in conclusion, um, I, will, I will share some images um, with my guys, with you, um, about how you may be thinking about another future. I, I shall begin with um, four quick images can we have the slides, please? I have, I have four quick images of uh, my nightmares, and then we shall uh, go on to the natural Zilla cities. Um, can we have the lights off? Yes. <coughs> Um, just a, a reminder of the, it's a map of 1880, reminder of uh, the British railway system that was put in to tie the um, economic cord to bind India and squeeze it for exports. 
Um, 150 years later, next one, please. Um, next. Oh, do I have a? No, I don't. 150 years later, we have the new industrial corridor map, second imperial economic binding core to squeeze India for exports. Um, in this, next one, please. Uh, we have a vision of our smart cities. Um, I am calling this uh, Ambanipur. <laughs> but actually it is in fact an image of Masdar, the original smart city which is already being built in uh, Abu Dhabi. <coughs> uh, these cities will be put together and controlled by probably Google and Amazon. There are no uh, elections or civil government in the conventional sense that we know it, they are being regarded as a 19th century out of date way of running a city. But basically, these are the places where um, smart cities will, will go. And the kind of life, can we have the next one please, that we would expect there would be uh, something of this nature. Um, next please. Um, when I talk about the, the, the India being in the center of an arc across the regions of the east and west, in, in this map you can, you can see uh, what are the regions we have to connect to and what our future is, is going to hold for us. Now, there are two aspects to this. There is not only the environmental aspect, but there is the economic aspect. So this is the economic and cultural uh, future of India if we are to survive uh, in the next era. Next please. The, the Hindu Kush Himalaya controls the ecology of this region. Water is going to become the most important element of our lives. There are ten rivers the Amudarya, the Brahmaputra Ganges, Indus, Irawadi, Mekong, Salvin, Tarim, Yangtze, and the Yellow River. And there are 16 countries which are had to work together in order to not fall prey to the divisive uh, tendency we seem to have. Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, China, India, Burma, Myanmar. Nepal, Pakistan, Cambodia, Kyrgyzstan, Laos, Tajikistan, Thailand, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, and Vietnam. The 16 countries that form the environmental net which is going to be relevant for the next uh, era. Next one, please. When you're coming back to India, um, <coughs> let me show you the, the situation. There is uh, a map on that side, Kane Chaudhary's pre-European map of trade and movement. And this is the ground map showing the settlements of the same region today. And it seems to me fairly obvious where our future trading and contacts and cultural movements lie. Next one, please. Um, the satellite map of India is very interesting because it's gives us the settlement pattern as it exists today. And also each of these bright lights, as two years been shown you, is potentially for us a, a, a natural zilacity. From these um, satellite images are constructed the Grump maps, thank you, next one please, which give, reveal to us the settlement patterns of, of India. And that is the long duration settlement pattern of, of this country. <clears throat> Each of these dots would represent a potentially a panchayat or a zilla settlement. Each of these regions would be the productive center, the economic center of India in the future era. We are a country which is not going to industrialize. It has been deindustrializing for 10 years. If we keep on trying to industrialize it, we will come to an end very shortly. 
80% we imagine of these uh, each of these regions would be self-sufficient in terms of its water, power, waste and production. And this is possible because people uh, like the Nobel laureate Elena Ostrom and also I think Amartya Sen uh, who has in his freedom and development written about it. They explore the relationship on which we have to base our future which is how to run our common pool resources. And, and uh, I'm going to show you uh, what Elena Ostrom's work has done. She's identified this common how these common pool resources are at work. Next, please. And there are eight points which she feels are important in order to uh, make the system. When we talk about reassembling the subcontinent, we have an opportunity now to, to adopt much of this and to revive at the panchayat level the system of common pool resources. It has great relevance. I think Ostrom's work has great relevance um, for the long duration of our survival. Um, and if that happens by the 21st century, it will be the 17th generation after it began, the modernization began in the 16th, the 17th century. That will form the first generation of um, recovery and sustainability as our current era of greed dies down. So, um, next one please. Um, Here is a view of a typical Zilla natural city. Um, in the city of the dreams where the high ground adjacent to the flood plains of the river which are the reservoirs of water provided by nature free of cost for a perennial supply of mineral water to the city. This is an urbanized area of 15 kilometers by 15 kilometers and is divided into, into 100 blocks um, which are 1.5 kilometers by 5 kilometers. Next one please. And then, and then here is a map of it um, just to give you an idea of the porosity of the urban fabric where agriculture and urban living is combined Food production is going to be one of the most critical, organic food production is going to be one of the most critical resources that are going to be important in the next era. Next one please. And then there's a typical one and a half kilometer by one and a half kilometer block which is self-governed by its society and made porous for um, agricultural purposes. And I put across a number of other plans. Next one, please. Um, so you could have in different zillas, different cities, with different maps, different configurations. Next one, please. Here, a high-speed link uh, has been put in um, in order to um, establish the links between cities. Next one. This may all sound um, utopian to my grandson, uh, so I would offer to take him on a trip to Telangana and continue our ongoing discussion with farmers and the Telangana government for the setting up of the first of the natural Zilla cities. Uh, what we did was we prepared a proposal, we went around, we talked to a lot of farmers with a huge success on the possibilities of not only going organic but being self-sufficient uh, in terms of production. Next one. We produced a report which we gave uh, to the Telangana government. Um, it began with just a simple proposal that they would likely accept which is that we guarantee to supply you mineral quality water to the population of one particular block. Um, which they were otherwise buying in bottles. So this was the limited ambition. 
But the real ambition of this is to actually set up a self-ruling, uh, self-sustaining uh, district. So the, the mechanic, I'll just run you through the mechanics, it's very simple how one does this. Next, please. So we take the state of Telangana, and it's not rocket science. You identify the particular district, which we have identified as Sirsila. Uh, you go down next to the next level, next please, and you see its uh, blocks and the panchayats in that area. So as a, as a, as a team, um, when we go there, we have before us, that's the number of panchayats. That's the system of sustenance for which they have to become completely self-reliant. And then we carried out some tests uh, to, to find out the quality of water. Next week, um, after going onto the satellite image, identifying through the river, and one of the moving figures is here sitting with us in the audience, Vikram, Dr. Vikram Soni, who then, and next one please, took the tests. And this is water which is contained from the satellite image. We were able to identify the forest area. And from that forest area, we took the water out from its subsoil level and found it to be of the highest mineral quality that you buy at 15 or 18 rupees. A bottle here. So the resources, the possibilities, everything is, is, is lying dormant. Next one. And so some images of how we see uh, what these Zilla cities can be like. Next one, please. Perhaps with grazing, because with Eleanor Ostrom's work, actually, we are able to evaluate the balance between the grazing ground, the growing agriculture, what are the common resources, etc. Next one, please. And perhaps uh, alternate energies to make themselves self sufficient. I just uh, concluding slide um, where we hope, next one, please, where it represents uh, for us what we are trying to do on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you. Usually memorial lectures uh, do not end up with question answer, but Mr. Kostla has agreed to take some questions. So if you have, brevity remains the Soul of wit or whatever. They so please. Evening. Uh, so we were impressed by your memory lecture, and uh, so we wanted to know, like you've talked about the urban landscape. So when you call, you showed us the Ambani Pur. So was that was not a multi-story, was it? Uh, are we going to like grow vertically or we going to grow horizontally? I think that. Uh, um, you know, the, the, the question of whether we grow vertically or horizontally is not the issue. What, what uh, distinguishes uh, smart cities and Ambanipur is the fact that it is walled, that only the inhabitants and the service staff are let in. So the social relationship uh, is a fractured one because you are dividing up uh, the manufacturers and the elite living people who run in the corporate city. So whether it goes high or low is an environmental question. Um, now, the studies have shown that up to eight floors is viable environmentally. After that, the, the, it tips off and you get mental harm coming. But I think much more work uh, probably will need to be done on this. We have an opportunity to, in fact, um, Lead, uh, lead the way for such type of cities. Although now China, I understand, has, has already begun to 
to found <coughs> and support the forest, 200 forest cities, which are also based on the same principle. 20,000. 20, yes. Yes. <coughs> For sharing your work in Telangana. Uh, back home here in Delhi, which almost feels like you're already living in a dystopian city, we already have agriculture along the river, along the Yamuna. We already have farmers who are uh, practicing what we can call urban farming. And I think that's something to remember. Um, and we are sort of bent on uh, removing that. The evictions every, every year, there are about three to four evictions that the farmers face. Just a few days back, there was an eviction in Bela Estate, right next to ITO. And I think the sort of, I think, look at history and narrative that you presented today, um, in the light of that, I guess the same, I mean, the same thing will carry on in the future as well. And it won't be a surprise when, perhaps 10 years from now, when we have completely obliterated farming from, from the heart of our city, we actually, you know, get a German architect or a French architect to say, you know what Delhi needs right now? We need urban farming. And that's when we are going to, I think, import the concept back into our city. So I guess another pessimistic note to yours. yours. I think that the, uh, the fact of urban farming itself is connected to making the city self-sufficient in food. So if you go to the Mandi in Delhi and you see the trucks coming in from as far away as Andhra, you realize it's not a system that can last. It's not. It, 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 the city is parasitic on the production process of food in the country, and you have to end that. So Delhi has sufficient agricultural land and sufficient parks. Sufficient. Imagine India just having gobies. Um, you'd have to adopt some pretty severe. And the Yamuna has that. Gobies are grown yes, around the Yamuna. Yes, but it's no way near the requirement yeah. that you need to feed the city. You have to depopulate the city. Uh, good evening. My name is Radhika Vishlani. Um, I heard you two, you were talking about you know water, water being taken out, which is extremely pure and much more mineral-rich content. But as of now, in Delhi and in most of the other big metro cities, we are facing a problem where they have sunk in bores which are like 200, 250 meters, where uh, the water that's coming out is completely saline, and uh, and the further down deep we go, you know, we're actually destroying aquifers, and ultimately when that water comes up, uh, I've seen in the rural areas where they have gone even further down that there is a, a sort of a white kind of a layer of some kind of minerals which are coming from deep inside the earth which is going to make the earth completely um, not productive as in zero production in the next few years. So uh, how would that be addressed? You see the, uh, Thank you. the information that we need on the condition of our subsoil water is not available easily. You can get it from um, satellites. But basically the whole of North India has not got any subsoil water left, which is pure. So uh, it's been over pumped and the agricultural chemicals have penetrated down uh, into the subsoil water. So you cannot, if you, perhaps if you don't have any tube wells in the whole of North India for 30 years, you might just begin to reverse the trend. It doesn't look uh, as if that's going to happen because the principle of self-sufficiency doesn't apply. The, the principle of catching the monsoon rains, of using, not building over floodplains, using the floodplains as the reservoir, none of this, uh, none of this is uh, put into practice. So we, we live, as I said, within an imperial era. And these are not things that are paid attention to.
as intently or as Keep it close to your mouth. Curiously, your grandson would have. And then I have some natural questions which follow from that kind of listening. I look at history some more, and I find that this image has been an image in the past, of course, for the subcontinent. And the very aspects of these images left the subcontinent vulnerable for loot and plunder in the first place. The decentralized political system, the pushing back of uh, the knowledge systems towards some kind of a perversion of divine insights and uh, regional knowledge systems into a perverted idea of superstition and dogma. And then I see, will the history again recycle itself into coming back to the same path, asking the same questions? So my question fundamentally would be to the first and the most fundamental part of your lecture. That would be the political image of India. And the second question is, what is the agency that we assume? Is it a positivistic agency like a state? Or is it a you know, cultural or social figure like a Gandhi who could take this image on? Thank you. Well, um, I think most of our history of the past um, has been written uh, to show what a terrible place the past was and how amazing uh, our new era is. So I think you need to, to read some other histories to get a more balanced view of what was going on in the past. Because if you write history about kings and wars, you always get an impression that that what was India was. It was about wars, violence, and kings. But that is not the history of this country. Secondly, with regard to how you take this lead up, you see, you don't need a Gandhi. We have in our constitution the 73rd and 74th amendments. And they empower the panchayats to do what I've said. But will parliament allow them to do it? No. It's a very simple, you don't need Gandhi to do it. Oh, well, there is a Gandhi coming up. But you don't, you don't necessarily need a big leader to do this. You just have to be honest with your constitution. You have a constitution which guarantees uh, social security and, well, and health and education for its entire population, which is followed by a clause in the Constitution that says, however, this responsibility is outside the purview of the courts. So I, as a citizen, cannot go to the Supreme Court and say, but my Constitution has guaranteed me education and health and you're not giving it, because that's out. So we have got all of these uh, problems with why we have not, why we have continued to be imperial. We haven't democratized the country. Well, friends, with that we come to the end of the evening. Uh, surely not the end of the evening, you will have other things to do. But thank you very much, uh, Mr. Romy Costa, for a wonderful presentation. And I'm sure the audience has enjoyed it. And since you brought the matter of Gandhi, uh, let me tell you that on 21st, we, under the series we are running in India International Center called Gandhi Matters, and this is a series which is going to run for every month during the 150th year of Gandhiji. We have a discussion, Gandhi and the unspeakable, his final experiment with truth. A dialogue with James Douglas. So you are all invited most cordially. And I can assure you when we are doing something, that is the Raza Foundation is doing something, nothing more interesting is hap happening anywhere else. So you can be assured of that, uh, whether it is music or dance or theater or ideas or whatever. So please do come and may I... Thank you.
एंड नाउ एज वी सेम्स अबाउट गुडली हिंदी आप जहाँ जाना चाहते हैं वहाँ जा सकते हैं